speaking to us today is Brother Dan Jenkins. Uh, he said he simply wants to be introduced as a gospel preacher. But I'm going to add a few more things uh, quickly. Uh, he's married to a wonderful woman named Judy. They have four children, 13 grandchildren, and 12 great-grandchildren. Uh, he did mission work in New Zealand for probably all told 10 years and then uh, was instrumental in bringing the gospel to another a number of those island nations uh, in the South Pacific as well. And he's currently at the uh, Palm Beach Lakes Church of Christ in West Palm Beach, Florida. And now, uh, if you'd please give your attention to Dan Jenkins speaking to us on the God of Scripture, God the Son. So is he really the son of God? Is he really deity? Every person on this earth must face that decision in their life and especially every young people. Young people, this lesson is for you. If I would ask you, why do you believe Jesus is the son of God? You need to have that answer. Your faith is going to be tried and someday you'll have to make a decision based on that very basis. And if the answer that you give, I believe in Jesus, I believe in, in God, simply because my mom and my daddy told me about it. Let me tell you about Santa Claus, the Easter fairy, and the, uh, the Easter bunny, and the tooth fairy, and how'd all that turn out? What is the basis of our faith? The book of John is the basis of our lesson. John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We, we know who that is. Young people, you know who that word is that became flesh. But look in John chapter 1 verse 1. And substituting the word Jesus for the word in John chapter 1 verse 1. Because we know who the word is. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. That's it folks. This, big, this book begins with an affirmation that Jesus is deity. You know how it ends? Look in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Almost the very end of the book, the last two verses of chapter 20. John says, many other signs, look at that word signs. Many other signs did Jesus do in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these, these signs are written in this book that you might believe that Jesus is the son of God. There it is. God does not ask you to blindly have faith that Jesus is deity. God does not ask for us to hide our heads in the sand and, and, and remove all sensibility from our minds. The signs are there from God. Jesus claimed that he was the son of God and God confirmed that he was the son of God. And many other signs did Jesus. In the book of John, the word sign and signs are found 17 times. It's the very theme in many respects of the entirety of the book of John. John could have written this book, and as he says in the last verses of the last chapter, and if he'd written every one of them down, the world itself could not contain all of the things that he accomplished in his life. But he gave us these signs. Nicodemus understood it. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these signs that thou doest except God be with me. Here's the crux. Jesus said, I am the son of God. I was there in the beginning. I was there before Abraham ever existed. I was there and all things were made through me. And you can bet your life, you can risk your soul, you can risk your eternal destiny on the fact that Jesus is the son of God. But what signs does he give? We will look in this lesson at some seven or eight signs, depending on how you count them, that John records in this book. You want to know the outline of this sermon? These signs are written. And so let's begin. I want you to forget about being here in the 21st century. I want you to imagine that you are a first century Christian. Can I borrow your imagination? Can you go back with me and let's be that first century Christian or first, first, a first century individual and we are faced with the reality that there is Jesus and we're faced with the reality that he's doing all of these things and we've got to make up our minds about him. Now, if I can have your imagination one more time, 
I want you to imagine that you are a laborer. You are a hired servant at a marriage feast. And it is your responsibility to make sure that the wine is there, that it is at least in some way distributed. At least you're some way in charge of it. And then all of a sudden, in that first century, can I have your imagination? In that first century, you think, oh no, we're running out of wine. What shall we do? It's not your responsibility. You're only a labor. But you tell others about it. And then the crisis arrives because there is no more wine. And all of a sudden, this stranger walks up and his mother says, Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And he says, you see those six stone water pots that are there? Fill them up with water. Some six earthen uh, uh, vessels are there. They hold some 20 or 30 gallons each. That's 150 gallons of water. And you and perhaps others that are helping you carry and transport all of that water, some, some, some 1,700 pounds of water, and you pour all of that water, you're dead tired, and no sooner do you get the last of those, those containers filled than that stranger says, now take some of it out. And before your imagination, you look into that, and as you take that out, you see it's no longer water. It is wine. You smell the aroma. What's just happened? Before your eyes, something has happened. And it's all because of this man that you've never met. You find out because of others who are talking about. You find his name is Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. But you already know nothing good can come out of Nazareth. But he's from Nazareth. And before your very eyes, he has done something that you have no earthly explanation for the latter part of John chapter 2 there is that individual that nobleman who is there who comes back from to, comes over from Capernaum to Cana of Galilee and when he, when he arrives in, when he comes for Capernaum he's come to Cana because Jesus is there and because that's, that's where you've lived. You've grown up there in that Galilee, that, that northern province of Israel. You, you, you're, you're, you're going to hang around him and see what happens. And all of a sudden, this nobleman, some, some nobility, some person of great importance comes over and says, Heal my son. My son is sick. My son may be dying. Heal my son. And Jesus says, Go home. Your son is cured. And you make this decision. I'm going to follow this gentleman back to Capernaum. I'm going to find out what everything I can find out about this man from Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Jesus is from Nazareth. But he did turn that water into wine. And so it's a day's journey. And so when you arrive the next day, as the nobleman arrived at his place, the servants come out and says, your son is alive. And the nobleman says, what time did he begin to heal? And the Servants say, the messengers say, not that he began to heal, but at, the first, at one o'clock yesterday afternoon, he was healed. Just like that, the fever left him. And you knew that's exactly the time when Jesus had uttered those words. First century nobility, first century citizen, I ask you, who is this man, Jesus? We pause for one moment. Because you see, in reference to these two, the Bible says this was the first sign, this was the second sign, that's in the text. Let's pause for a minute in chapter 4. In chapter 4, there is that woman at the well. And we pause to point out the fact that whenever he's talking to her, she says, we know that when the Messiah comes, and Jesus says to this Samaritan woman, I am that Messiah. Is he crazy? Here's this individual, and you've seen him do two amazing things, but here's this individual, and he says, I am the Messiah. Chapter 5 is in Jerusalem. And you happen to be in Jerusalem for one of those feast days. You happen to be there because if you're in northern Galilee, you often come down to Jerusalem either on business or for, or, or for some reason. And you happen to be there. And there is this Jesus walking. And you begin to follow him around. And there's this man beside this pool of Bethesda. 
No, there's this crippled man that is there. Let me get it right. There is this crippled man that is there. And he talks about the fact that he believes that sometimes angels come and stir the water and whoever is first in the water is the one that is cured. And, and he says, I don't have anyone to help me. And Jesus doesn't say much at all about, about what he is thinking, except he does say to this, to this crippled man, take up your bed and walk. And before your very eyes, a man who has never walked picks up his bed and walks and the religious come and they are so upset that this man is walking, carrying his bedroll. Why? Because it's the Sabbath day. And Jesus cannot be good because he's profaned that Jewish Sabbath, or at least their interpretation of that Jewish Sabbath. He cannot be worth anything. And so when they asked the man who's carrying his bread, why are you carrying your bed? He said, a man that cured me told me I could do it. The implication is, You've got to deal with the fact that right in my life, a miracle has been performed and he's given me permission to do it. But when Jesus had cured him, Jesus fades back among the crowd and comes back to him later. And he says to that individual, my name is Jesus. And, and when the man, the crippled man learns that his name is Jesus, he goes back and tells those religious leaders and the Bible said, and they began to persecute Jesus and they decided to kill Jesus. They want to get rid of him. And he says to them, I'm just here, here doing the work of my father. Look at chapter 5, verse 18, whenever, whenever he says in verse 7, 16 and 17, that God is my father, they then sought to kill him the more because he made himself equal with God. First century citizen, there's this man in your life. And he's turned water into wine. He's cured the nobleman's son. And now this crippled man who hasn't walked for 38 years, this individual is now walking about. And he says he's the Messiah. Who is this stranger that's come into your life? And you begin to follow him every time and every place that you can. In fact, back up in Galilee, you've been falling for days. In fact, it's been three days and you're hungry. And all of a sudden, because you're listening to this man, Jesus, you want to find out what he's saying. You want to find out what he's talking about. And, and all of a sudden, you begin to get hungry. And, and there, it's not just you. There are 5,000 men, not counting women and children. There are thousands and thousands of individuals. And right before your very eyes, imagine you're sitting right in the front row. And you would be able to understand what happened when he picked up those five loaves of bread and those two fish. And whenever he broke the end of that bread off, did another piece of bread pop in there or another? Or did he have to break up all five rolls? And then all of a sudden, you use your imagination as to how that happened. But he stood there and he saw every bit of it. And then he ate. And he ate until he was filled and until the 5,000 men were filled, until all the women and children were filled and baskets full, not that little five loaves and two fishes that a young lad had, basketfuls were taken over. First century citizen, I ask you, who is this man, Jesus? And in John chapter six, that very night, you see the disciples as they get in a boat and they head out. Jesus is not with them. You know that. And then in the middle of the night, there's one of the worst storms you've ever, you've ever known to happen. Those cold winds came down off of, the, off, the, off of Mount Hebron, came down over the Sea of Galilee. And, and the Sea of Galilee becomes just like, almost like an ocean with all of the waves that are in it. And you've seen those disciples, you wonder, oh, they, they're about three or four miles offshore. Did they drown? The next day, you learn they're back over, over around Capernaum, over in that area. And so you rush over to where Jesus is. And by this time, you know some of these in, the, the individuals who are with Jesus, men like Peter and Andrew and James and John. And, and you say, tell us what happened and he says, here's what happened. We were out there and this boat was about to sink. 
We were there in the midst of this storm and we saw Jesus come walking on the water and when Jesus said, peace be still, that tempestuous sea of Galilee became as calm as any lake has ever been when it mirrored the, the things that are on shore. And while you did not see that miracle, you remember when that storm stopped. You experience the water turning into wine. You experience the nobleman's son. You experience the crippled man's son. You've experienced the feeding of the 5,000. And you've experienced the storm stopping. And read it carefully. Though they were in the midst of the sea, when Jesus says, peace be still, the text says immediately they were on the shore. John chapter 6. That's remarkable, is it not? I wish we had time to look at some of these things that are found in John chapter 6, but we, we really, really do not have time to look at all of these things. He talks about this manna that was there and that the, the manna that God had given from heaven and that he had hidden manna that, that, that he could give to them. And they were just amazed at all of the things that transpired. And then Jesus says something that is remarkable in the latter part of John chapter 8. Whenever Jesus talks about the fact to those individuals who have believed on him, chapter 8 verse 32 says that. In this discussion he begins talking about the fact that Abraham saw my day and he was glad. And they, they said, you're not even 50 years of age. You're not 50 years of age. How on earth could Abraham have ever known you? And then Jesus says something that is remarkable if you'll read it carefully. He says in verse 58, most assuredly I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. The word he is in italics. And when he said, I am, they took up stones to kill him because he said that he is the sacred name of Jehovah God that was given there at the burning bush. I am. And they killed him. They wanted to kill him. John chapter 9 is that blind man that we've talked about, mentioned before erroneously. But you know that story. You happen to be there, first century Christian, and you see when Jesus spits on the ground and he takes that spittle and the clay that is there and makes clay and, and puts the ointment on the man's eyes and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. He's a blind man. Somebody has got to lead that individual to that place, to the pool of Siloam. And because you're so intrigued by all that's transpired, you wonder what can happen. What remarkable thing could be about to happen? He who's turned the water into wine. This individual who has cured the nobleman's son. Uh, this, this individual who has told the man on the Sabbath day to take up his bed and walk. This individual who feeds the 5,000, who stills the tempest and in the middle of the night stops the storm instantly. Who is this individual that would now tell a blind man? Are you aware there's not one blind man in the Old Testament who ever had his eyes open? Something's about to happen that has never happened on the earth. And you're the one who takes that blind man. And you take that blind man and you lead him down to the pool of Siloam. And you help him get down whatever steps that are there. And he, and he some way, use your imagination. He dips down in some way and washes all of that spittle off of his face. And how can it not be other than these words that he said? I can see, I can see. Who is this man, Jesus? He claims he's God. He claims he is the I am. He claims he is equal with God. He claims he is the Messiah. Who is this man, Jesus? But tragedy comes in life. And in John chapter 11, there is tragedy upon tragedy. You happen to know a brother and two sisters who live in Bethany. And Jesus knows them. And you happen to be that first century citizen who's there whenever Lazarus gets so sick that word is sent to Jesus, Lazarus is sick. You happen to be that individual. 
who's there when that message is, is, is sent to Jesus. And Lazarus dies. Can I borrow your imagination and ask you to imagine that you're the ones who helped wrap him in whatever sort of burial garments there were. That you try to console those two sisters, Mary and Martha, because their brother is dead. And you're one of the ones who helped carry the body of Lazarus into that tomb. You're one of the ones who helps roll the stone back over the opening to that grave. But Jesus has not come. And it's rather obvious, is it not, that Mary and Martha have been talking to each other because of what they say. The first words both of them say when Jesus comes into their presence, he meets them individually, separately, and both of them say, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. My brother would not have died. And you think, is that, is, is that possible? Is it possible that he who turned the water into wine is it possible that, that he who cured the nobleman's son, is it possible that he helped the crippled man carry his bed on the Sabbath day, who fed the multitudes, he is the one who stilled the tempest, he, he is the one who's done all of these remarkable things, even in opening the blinds that nobody has ever, opened the eyes of the blind, that nobody had ever done in the history of mankind on this earth. Is it possible? And the thick thought comes to your mind. No, no. He couldn't do that, could he? And when he says, show me where he's buried. You walk out. And you see the most remarkable thing. As he stands and sees all that is transpired. And you literally see the tears. Flow down his cheeks. Jesus wept. And then with that same authoritative voice that he had said, whenever he said, fill those pots with water. With that same authoritative voice that he'd said to that crippled man, take up your bed and walk. With that voice he must have used whenever he said, peace be still. He now says, roll back the stone. And one of the sisters says, oh, no, no, no. We don't want the stench of death. We don't want to smell death. And the Bible said that Jesus said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And with your own eyes, you saw Lazarus as he, there is movement. No, is it possible? In the darkness of that, of that cave, that grave where he is, did I see movement? And then you see Lazarus, not as he walks out, but as he floats out because the text says, unbind him and let him go. And you have seen Lazarus raised from the dead. I ask you, first century Christian, who is this man, Jesus? And then I ask you the most important question you'll ever face in your life. Do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Son of God? How much more evidence would it take? Blessed are you who have seen, but far more blessed are those of us who have not seen, who have looked at the signs and we believe. On the day of judgment, God could say, did you believe in my son? And because you were here this very morning, you could not say, nobody ever gave me the evidence. 
the Apostle John gave you seven signs. And I ask you, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? It may be there are some young people here who need to obey the gospel. You may have been thinking about giving your life to Jesus. Not Jesus of Nazareth, that terrible place. But Jesus through whom all things that were created have been made. And Jesus who was with God. And Jesus who was God. To commit your life to him. Not with a blind step of faith. Based on un unanswerable evidence that he's deity. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? In John chapter 8, those individuals who believed on him to whom he said, I am. They believed on him and he said, but there's more to it than belief. John 8, 30. Verse 30 says they believed on him. Verse 31 says they believed on him. And in verse 42 he says to those Jews who, yeah, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe on him. He said, if God were your father, and isn't it remarkable that some individuals would proclaim today, if you want to be a child of God, all you've got to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said to people who believed he was the Son of God, if God were your father, and he says in verse 44, and you are of your father the devil. Jesus said you can believe on him and be a child of the devil. Why? Because you won't change your life. Are you a believer in Jesus? Are you some individual who's come to this service today? You're here because some family member encouraged you to come and to be a part of this service. It may be your husband. It could be your, could be your mother. It could be a cousin. It could be some friend of yours that has invited you to here today. I'm asking you, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? And do you believe it with all of your heart so much that you'll change your life? For God has appointed a day in which you'll judge the world by Jesus. John, Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. Will you repent this day? And if you will repent and be baptized, God will wash away every sin you've ever committed. Not because you're good, not because you've never made a mistake, but because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you are ready to commit your life to him. Except you repent, you'll perish. Don't let that be you. Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Have you done that? Implications? You cannot sit and say, I believe, but I've never been baptized and I'm saved. When Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You could do that this morning. If you're an unfaithful child of God, whose faith and devotion to the Lord has grown weak and you need to return to that first love, to that devotion you, just, you once had for him. You need, to, you need to understand that you need to come to Jesus. If you need to deal with sin in your life, won't you come to the Lord as we stand and sing this invitation song? Will you come?